Hi, uh, I am an enemy of the people. That's what Donald Trump called me and my colleagues at NBC News. I'm also a member of that hated group, the mainstream media, sometimes known on social media by its initials, MSM, like some shady paramilitary group, establishment, controlled by the deep state, fake news. Well, I wear that badge, mainstream media, with pride, and I want to try to tell you why. And I also want to suggest to you that I might actually be a friend of the people. I know, a journalist, imagine. Enemy of the people is a phrase often used by authoritarian leaders to attack those who don't agree with them. Journalists, judges, political opponents. But our job as journalists isn't to agree with those in power, it's to hold them to account. And the more power a leader has, the more responsibility we have as journalists to hold them to account, to make sure that they do the right thing by their people, not to enrich themselves or to stay in power for decades. Now, you might already think, this is a bit rich, right? Here's a journalist standing up and presenting himself as a kind of champion of morality and decency and truth and, and democracy, and I, I, I do get that. A poll taken a few months ago suggested that when people were asked, who do you trust in public life? Journalists came below estate agents, <laughs> bankers, probably poisoners, although I didn't look at the whole list, but above politicians. Um, but trust is the most important thing a journalist can have. Uh, it's our currency. When I was embedded with uh, British and American troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and in other places, they would often say to me, look, we just don't trust journalists. The media make things up. Uh, you want to spill our secrets. Well, here's what happened to me when I was embedded with the Royal Marines uh, just before the Iraq war in 2003. Uh, just days before the invasion, I was called into the tent of the lovely commanding officer and um, he decided to tell me what was going to happen. Not just what we were going to do with the Royal Marines, but what the British Army was going to do, and the American Army, the entire invasion plan. Everything. I mean, I was a bit, a bit stunned, and he said, um, you now know more than 95% of my men. Those notes that you've taken, what are you going to do with them? I said, destroy them? And he said, yes, because if you're captured with those, we are all buggered. But he trusted me. I suddenly had the most astonishing scoop, right? But I couldn't do a damn thing with it. I couldn't broadcast a word, because if I'd done that, it would have betrayed his trust. I would never have worked as a journalist again, and I would quite possibly have endangered not just myself and my crew, but the Marines I was with, and maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of troops. So I didn't say a thing for the entire war about what I knew was about to take place. He trusted me, and I did not betray his trust. So trust is vital. Responsibility is vital, too, for a journalist. Duty, uh, if you like. So when I was a young journalist in Northern Ireland, um, one of the worst things we all had to do during the Troubles was to knock on people's door after some terrible event, an explosion, a murder, and say, I'm really sorry, I'm a journalist. Is there anything you would like to say? Is there any statement you would like to make? And remarkably, people usually did have something to say. One day, a colleague of mine knocked on the door of a man called Gordon Wilson. Gordon Wilson, just a few hours earlier, had cradled his dying daughter, Marie, a nurse, in the ruins of Enniskillen after a mass killing. And the journalist said, Mr. Wilson, do you have anything to say to the people who did this? And he said, yes, I do. He said, I bear them no grudge, no ill will. In fact, I'll pray for them every night. 
and it still chokes me up, actually. It was such an astonishing message of forgiveness, and it went round the world. And that was a message of forgiveness that would not have got out were it not for mainstream media. We sent that message around the world. That's our job. It's also our job to, or at least it is with me, because I was a foreign correspondent for three, four decades, to go overseas to find things out in wars, in Ukraine, in Syria, to shine a light in dark places, to give a voice to the voiceless and to victims. Now, those sound like cliches, but they also happen to be true. So I did 13, 14 trips to the war in Syria. I was able to ask President Assad 84 questions in an interview. By then, his forces had killed tens of thousands of Syrian civilians. And I said, how do you sleep at night, having just given the orders to barrel bomb civilians in civilian areas? What do you say to your children at breakfast in the morning about the deaths of thousands of children in Syria? Those are questions no Syrian journalist would have dared to ask their president and head of state. Um, in Mexico, I was able to ask a, uh, uh, a killer, a hired killer, why he murdered innocent people for a cartel's money. Now, that's the kind of question that would have got any Mexican journalist murdered, because hundreds are murdered all the time. We go to the places that you can't go to ask the questions that you can't ask. So in North Korea, I asked officials how they could justify spending tens of millions on weapons programs when millions of their own people lived in dire poverty. We ask those questions, but there is a terrible price to pay for being a journalist abroad. So in the first 12 weeks of the war in Ukraine, 12 journalists have been killed, one a week. But globally, the figure is much more than that. Uh, four, one, one journalist is killed or murdered every four days in the world. More than 100 a year. For as many years as I can remember. And I knew one guy, um, Pierre, from Dublin, who was killed just a few weeks ago in Ukraine. Fred Nerak was another guy, a cameraman that I hired for ITN. Um, he was also a painter and a jazz drummer, fantastic guy. And I joked with him one day, if you can call it a joke, I said, Fred, the only other Nerak that I knew, he was French, was Robert Nerak, a soldier who was in Northern Ireland and disappeared one night up near the border and his body was never recovered, probably shot. Well, it was a joke that came back to haunt me because Fred Nerak went into Iraq in the opening days of the invasion in 2003 near the border and was never heard from again. He was caught in an ambush. His body has never been recovered. He was probably shot. Alongside him was um, a colleague of mine, Terry Lloyd from ITN. Uh, Marie Colvin, another friend of mine, uh, Sunday Times journalist, mainstream media. You probably have seen pictures of her. She had an eye patch, black patch over her eye. She lost her eye in Sri Lanka. She lost her life in Syria, giving a voice to the voiceless, trying to um, show what was happening to civilians in Homs. But the regime didn't like her didn't appreciate what she was doing. They homed in on the satellite phone that she was using, and they shelled the house in which she was staying. And another uh, journalist died alongside her. So we, we pay a, a terrible price um, for what we do. Uh, you might say that even after all of that, um, you're not quite convinced. Um, and I, I, I do understand that. Um, but I wonder what the alternatives to the Western model of the mainstream media are. Um, Churchill 
once said that uh, the, the least worst form of government was democracy. I wonder, is our model of mainstream media the least uh, worst form? I mean, what are the alternatives? Because most people get their news in Britain, in America, and in Russia from television news. So let's just run through a few of those. How about Russia? Well, as we know, under uh, Vladimir Putin, there is no independent media. He controls all the TV stations. In Russia, you can be jailed for up to 15 years for not following the official line that the Ukraine war is a special military operation. How about China under President Xi? Well, uh, same thing, really. You simply do not question authority. And in Hong Kong, independent journalism is simply dead. How about inside the European Union, closer to home? Let's take Hungary. Uh, Viktor Orban has just won a fourth consecutive term in office. He lists among his enemies the international mainstream media. He and his allies control all the newspapers and all the TV stations inside the European Union. So his election speech was broadcast over and over again, endlessly on state television. Now, his election opponent did get some time. He got five minutes in the entire election campaign. That's the mainstream media inside the European Union, which is supposed to have a core value. One of the pillars of democracy is freedom of the press. So, you know, what we do extends not just to war, but to public life as well. As journalists, um, it's our job to be in the places where armies, uh, authorities, governments don't want us to be, and it applies it in politics too. Once upon a time, it was okay to ask a prime minister, Mr. Macmillan, do you have anything to say to us today? Well, not anymore. Governments spin. Governments deceive. Not all of them, but many of them, and not all the time. But some governments lie. Some governments lie all the time, and not just overseas. It can happen here, too. Our job is to separate the lies from the truth. Remember Watergate? A US president and his allies committed a crime, tried to cover it up, and they might have got away with it had it not been for dogged journalists finding out what they had done and exposing the truth. So I celebrate mainstream media, genuinely independent media, TV networks, who are uh, trained, full of trained, experienced journalists, who know the difference between truth and lies, who have high standards of evidence, and who also know that there, there is not two sides to a lie. And we are living in critical times. Uh, another alternative to mainstream media is well, you've all got them, one of these. Because on here, you don't have to wait for the news at 10. You can get it in the palm of your hand. And, you know, social media sites, some of them fantastic. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Mumsnet, all terrific. Um, Google, you know, you've got aches and pains. You want to find out what they are. What, what do these symptoms mean? All fantastic. But how much should we rely on social media? media on Facebook and YouTube. How useful really are they? Um, imagine those aches and pains lead you to hospital and you've got to have surgery. You would prefer, wouldn't you, that the surgeon was absolutely fully trained and not as he's about to cut you up having a quick squint at a YouTube video. Um, and I feel the same way about trained journalists. I don't want to rely on Facebook because it can also be a cesspit for conspiracy theories. 
Hillary Clinton runs a pedophile ring out of a pizza restaurant in Washington. That went round America like wildfire. So yes, I mean, I celebrate independent media. And let's be honest, we are living in extraordinary times. This is a turning point in history. Certainly in Europe, this is a defining moment with the Ukraine war. And there's lots more than that. China is rising, flexing its muscles. The climate crisis is deepening. COVID isn't done with us yet. The cost of living crisis is critical for people here. And inflation is he not just here, but it's in Europe indeed. It, it, it will begin to sweep much of the rest of the world. Who do you really want to tell you about these things? Your uncle's best friend who read something on Facebook? Boris Johnson and his government? Vladimir Putin and his friends in the Kremlin? President Trump? And watch that space, because that could be coming back. Or skeptical journalists, annoying, inquiring, critical, brave, courageous journalists who are trained to smell out cover-ups, who ask inconvenient questions, and who know how to separate the truth from the lies. I know who I choose. Thank you.